So we now have a uh, counterintuitive but very interesting replacement for the Newtonian description of gravity. And it says that space-time is curved. And the direct way to ascertain that is you can do it locally if you have very sensitive uh, measuring apparatus. You can, deter you can measure the relative motion of things. And it's going to be very small, but you can see it. And that's very different from the Newtonian explanation, which is, hey, I detect gravity by the fact that these things are all hurtling towards the Earth um, or orbiting around the Earth in what Newtonian gravity thinks, Newtonian description of the world thinks is not a geodesic, but which Einstein would say that really is a geodesic, just in a curved geometry. But even if we ex accept this idea that uh, space-time is curved, where does the curvature come from? It seems to have something to do with uh, gravitating bodies, with matter or mass. So um, we need to explain that. We need to have some theory of that. And it's, what it's going to do is it's going to replace Newton's action at a distance, which he never liked. The idea that the Earth can somehow act at a distance, say, on the moon and pull it towards the Earth or on any object. The slogan, which um, I think is actually due to Wheeler himself, um, one version of it would be matter tells space how to curve, and then space tells matter how to move. Um, let me amend that just a little bit. What about matter tells space how to curve? Well, it seems like mass is what is telling space how to curve. Mass seems to be the source of, uh, of gravity. If the Earth were made of styrofoam, which would be kind of fun, um, it wouldn't produce as much space-time curvature, wouldn't have as much of an effect on the objects near it. Um, so it has something to do with the mass. Well. It turns out, if you think relativistically, if you think, combine this again with special relativity, which I'm not, I'm not talking about too much here, um, what you have to amend that as is really it's mass energy. That um, there's this thing that is best known as mass energy, which can be in the form of mass or it can be in the form of energy, and it kind of slosh back and, back and forth between the two by the equivalence of mass and energy. And it's the mass energy in some region that's telling space how to curve, and then space tells matter how to move. It comes from E equals mc squared, or more properly, it's really that energy is the crucial thing, and mass is best seen as kind of the irreducible part of, of energy. It's present even when something is rest. When something is moving, um, or if there's some sort of uh, magnetic or electric field or something like that, there can be energy due to those things, and those actually themselves cause uh, space to curve, which is a very interesting prediction of Einstein's theory. Um, and mass can just be a part of that. It's usually the dominant part of it, basically because c squared is so big. Uh, that's the speed of light squared. So here's th the three basic rules for space-time curvature. Um, I'm certainly not going to give you the full equations or anything like that, but here's the three rules to give you an idea. First is gravitation is the curvature of a geometry, the geometry of space-time, and uh, gravitation really comes from that curvature. Um, and as I said before, the direct things you can measure to really precisely measure the curvature are really actually what, what Newton thought of as tidal forces, which he thought of as kind of small leftovers, but which actually really are now seen as the fundamental forces or the fundamental uh, detectors of the curvature of geometry, and that's what shows up as gravitation. Now, the fact that it's the curvature of a kind of geometry, it's not anything goes you might get the impression that once you go away from Euclidean geometry, I can have whatever. But in fact, being the curvature of a geometry really imposes many, many constraints on what can happen. And that's actually crucial. I'll talk about that in a minute as to why it's so crucial. Second rule is that in empty space, away from mass energy, it's not that the curvature is equal to zero. It's that the average curvature equal to zero. Curvature can work in various directions. To measure curvature, it's not just a number. You have to say, in what directions am I looking at? And then I get a, whether the curvature is attracting or repelling in those directions. And this picture is a great example of that. Um, if you go in this direction, remember the, the Earth would be down here in this picture, and you're in a spacecraft. If you go in these directions, perpendicular to towards the Earth, what you get is that gravity actually looks like it's attracting. I mean, so that's not the surprising one, sorry. <laughs> yeah, amazing, it's attracting. I'm getting myself confused. It looks like gravity is attracting these directions. Here's the weird one. If you go up and down toward or away from the gravitating body, it actually looks like gravity is a repulsive force. 
That is very interesting. But it turns out that it's absolutely necessary for how this theory works. On average, away from a gravitating body, this is exactly what you're supposed to see, averaging to zero. Some directions, it's, it, has, it has an attractive af effect, as if this thing is actually pulling the things nearby into it. And on other directions, it has a repelling effect. And so that's a co good like little cocktail party takeaway from this talk. You can say, ooh, I know that gravity can be repulsive in some ways. And it's really that the tidal forces, the tidal effect, uh, which is central to the relativistic description, has to be repelling in sort of half the directions if you're in empty space. Um, and so that's, this is what happens inside the, um, the spacecraft, because that is in empty space. And so the local effect actually averages out to zero. Now, in number three is that inside matter, inside the Earth, for example, the average curvature is going to be, um, is going to be um, attractive. It's not going to average out to zero. And the amount of that average curvature is basically proportional to the density, very roughly, meaning the density of mass energy. And there's a lot of other things about the fact that it's all happening in different directions that makes it complicated. But roughly, it's that the average curv curvature is proportional to the density. So inside the Earth, you would actually see a very different picture. They would all be attracting to each other, or they'd all sort of go, the arrows would all go in, and you'd get a non zero average curvature inside matter. So, um, how does this mean, how does this replicate the, the world of gravity that, that we know of? Um, and in particular, how does the presence of the Earth in one place affect the spacecraft away from the Earth or the Moon or anything anywhere nearby? It's, the, again, the nature of curvature, the fact that it has uh, a lot of mathematical laws that it has to satisfy, it forces non-zero curvature in empty space. Now, remember, the average curvature has to be zero, but there is an effect. There are these arrows. They're not all just nothing. There are these effects. It's just that they have to average out to be nothing by having some be attracting and some be repelling. It turns out, and this is the math I'm not going to really talk about too much at all, that the nature of the way curvature of a geometry works is that if you have a curvature in one part of space, especially this part, kind of curvature that on average is actually attracting, if that's happening in one part of space, then nearby you can't have just absolutely no curvature at all. It can't be Euclidean geometry with no curvature. But it's going to be this kind of curvature that has average zero, some attracting, some repelling. So one way to think about it is sort of like heat and waves, curvature propagates from its sources. That you've got a certain kind of curvature inside the Earth, and that necessarily means that there's going to be a, a different kind of curvature, but still curvature, away from the Earth. And this is the replacement for action at a distance. Um, and it's an important replacement, because just like heat and waves, what's going on there is that the curvature inside the Earth affects what has to be happens has to happen right at the surface of the earth and that affects what has to happen 10 meters above and that's what has to affects what has to happen 10 meters above that etc just like a wave propagating a wave doesn't have a magical action at a distance heat doesn't propagate with infinite speed and affect something um, infinitely you know arbitrarily far away and so it's a local process um, that everything affects what's nearby but if everything affects what's nearby, then that's going to have something, an effect that propagates farther away than you might expect. Okay? So this is kind of a diagram of the new understanding, is that gravity is caused by propagation of curvature. You've got the Earth in here. That on, Inside, you've got um, the kind of curvature that in all directions is attractive. So averaging, it's non-zero. It's an attractive force overall. And because it can't suddenly jump to exactly flat and no kind of curvature, there's going to be an effect here, and then out here, and then out here, and then out here. And that effect is going to get less and less as you go. That's the way the mathematics actually tells you it works. But the curvature does propagate. What happens is that um, the, the curvature ends up, because it's an empty space, being this kind that if you look at it from the spaceman's view, that is um, average zero. But, um, but it's really there. There is an effect. And then we've seen how this uh, idea of putting the ring of balloons around the Earth explains why, even though locally it's a small effect, it can actually kind of add up to, be, to, it, to seem like the Earth is pulling you into it. Um,
and that it seems like there's this force of gravity. Okay, so this idea of propagation of curvature is somewhat familiar. It's like stretching fabric. If you take some fabric and you stretch it in one place, then it's gonna that stretching is going to distort the fabric in a large region. You can't just say, okay, I'm just going to stretch it in this little region and have nothing else happen around it. Here's a nice piece of stretch fabric I got off the web. If I try to distort this fabric in one place, that's necessarily going to distort the fabric in a larger region than I want necessarily want it to be distorted in. And so that's a good metaphor. Sometimes you'll see these, you'll see a lot of these pictures of like taking a, a bowling ball and putting it on a trampoline as a metaphor for how gravity works. I hate those pictures because there's so much misleading about them. But the thing that's not misleading is this idea of if you stretch the fabric, if you will, the geometry of space and time in one place by saying having the mass of the Earth right here, it is necessarily going to create curvature effects outside. And if you actually analyze what those curvature effects do to, um, to geodesics, to free fall and straight lines, they actually do have the effect of um, stuff being pulled in and falling towards the Earth. But there's definitely a few steps there. It's not, um, you have to go through those steps to really figure out how that works.